Hey everybody, welcome back. This is Wall Framing video number five in our series. We're going to go over some new components. We're going to talk about some details uh, of headers and interior walls uh, and partitions. Um, so to do this assignment, you're going to need a piece of paper and something to write with. Take the notes I tell you to take, and at the end of it, take a photo of it and submit it on campus. All right, let's get going here. So uh, corner assembly. Now, there's several different ways to go to corner assembly. We're going to talk about those a little bit later. I am going to cover and focus on the California corner, or the book calls it an energy efficient corner. Uh, it's highlighted in blue right here. Okay? And here's the definition I want you to copy. It studs place at the intersection of two walls. It strengthens the wall frame and provides an attachment point for drywall or wall covering. Now, over on the other side of my screen there, I've got a little uh, diagram of what the layout looks like. And in the blue and green X's, what basically they represent is the end studs of your walls, A and B. Um, and that red X, that's the actual California corner. So I'll talk more about those as we get to, the, to that slide. But uh, again, it's placed at the intersection of two walls. It strengthens the wall frame, provides a place for interior wall covering, whether that's drywall, paneling, uh, tongue and groove boards, whatever is going to be your interior wall. Okay. Now, if you don't have this copy, hit the pause button and hit play when you are going on. But I'm going to, when you're finished, but I'm going to keep running. Double top plate is our next. Um, that's our next component. It is a plate made of two members, provides better stiffening of the wall section, and it also is used to connect splices, corners, and partitions that are at right angles or perpendicular to a wall. So if you can remember back to our first video, I was talking about top plate. I specifically said, hey, when you're looking at what was highlighted in blue in that video, notice there was a piece, another board on top of that. Well, that's our double top plate. So now it's highlighted in blue here. It's a double top plate. Now our top plate is below this. Can you see this red line right here? And when I, when I talk splices, that means bringing two boards together. Because typically, your building is going to be longer than what your top plates and bottom plates will allow. So you're going to have to join them together somehow. And you would not normally splice two top plates together above a header. However, in the, just for this, uh, just for this example, imagine that the two top plates ended here. What that's going to do is they're going to they're going to be together, but having this double top plate on here, that will that will prevent any movement side to side, any kind of lateral movement here. So it makes the wall frame stiffer. And it also, when you have an interior partition. The, uh, the double top plate for this wall will can sit over the exterior wall and it helps lock them together. And I'll talk more about that as we get to framing out. And once we have our wall set up, I'll show you specifically what that looks like. Okay? You should have this copy by now. If you don't, then hit the pause button. All right, here we go. Partitions. I just was talking about partitions. Uh, what I've got circled here, this is a partition assembly. It means this is where an interior wall will catch along this exterior wall here. But a partition specifically is a wall that subdivides space within a building. Think the wall that separates your living room from a bedroom, the wall that separates your bathroom from the bedroom, or the closet from the bedroom, the wall that separates your kitchen from your living room, so on and so forth. So, Walls that are inside of a building, it just makes that big space into smaller sections. Okay, that's what a partition is. Now, there's two types of partitions. There's non-load bearing and there's load bearing, or non-bearing and bearing. Okay? A non-bearing, non-load bearing sound is just like what it means. It doesn't support any weight. However, a bearing wall, so a bearing partition or wall, is one that supports the floors and roof above it, uh, in addition to its own weight. So it doesn't just separate the rooms, it helps support ceiling joists or rafters uh, or floor joists above it. Okay. But again, what you see right here is just the place where that wall frame 
the interior wall will connect to this wall picture. Okay. Now, this diagram, what it shows is uh, highlighted in red are walls that are likely load-bearing walls. Highlighted in blue are walls that are likely non-load-bearing. So how you can tell the difference and why are why is it one, not the other? Okay, so we've got a rectangular building here, 68 feet by 40 feet. More often than not, your floor joists and ceiling joists and rafters are gonna be running across the short dimension. So they're gonna be running this way in this building here. So if your walls run perpendicular to the joist, so the joists are running this way, Walls are running this way, that's perpendicular. So everything in red is likely load-bearing here. Now, the wall like right here, this part of this closet, this little pantry, and, and uh, the water heater, and this part, they might not be load-bearing, but they certainly are underneath the joist. But the long wall here and here, and the long in here, very good chance those are load bearing. Um, now the walls in blue, they're running parallel with all your joists. So more often than not, they're not gonna sit directly under a joist or a rafter, so they're probably not load bearing. Now, they might sit under a, a rafter, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they still support that rafter, and if they do, it's just that rafter, not the entire roof, okay? So what's in blue, non-load bearing, What's in red? Load bearing. Okay, one more component to go over is blocking. Okay, that's a wood block used as a filler piece and support within framing methods. So it's highlighted in blue here, here, and here. So in that partition assembly, there's three pieces of blocking. And just so that you can space these two boards out, um, so there's a place to connect that interior wall. Okay, so that's your blocking. There. Now, this is not the only place you do find blocking. There's a few other places that you'll find blocking. Okay. Um, up around your windows, a quality contractor will have the crew put in blocking up at the tops of the windows to catch curtain rods. Okay, it's better support than just drywall anchors. Or let's say this is, there's a bathroom in here and you need a place to hang your toilet paper holder. They'll put a piece of blocking there. And it might just be a piece of two by four so that you got there so you can screw it in there and it's secure. Or if it's a bathroom and you've got a shower head, you'll put a piece of blocking up there for your shower head and a piece of blocking down in here for the handle. Okay? So there's a lot of places you can put blocking in, but oftentimes it's just a place that fills the space between two framings members and it provides a little extra support okay so now i'm going to jump ahead and talk about headers get it jumping ahead for headers okay the most common type of header that we're going to have and i'll go over these ones right is a built-up header i'll talk a little bit more about it here but there is a um and i have these ought to look familiar because they're photos of the header display I have over by the water fountain. Okay, so built up header, this is what we're going to be doing primarily. And it is a two by a piece of OSB or a two by. So two by OSB, two by makes up from here to here, three and a half inches. Okay, another option is a box beam header. This is also pretty popular. You've got your two by piece here, your two by piece here, and then you have a bottom and top cord of two by fours. And those are nailed in from the bottom and from the top. Now, because you have that three and a half inch thick wall, that's the depth of the wall, and you have two by and two by, there's a half inch of airspace noted in blue here. That's just airspace, um, which can provide a little bit of a thermal break. Um, which means when it's cold outside, 
this board that's closest to the exterior will get cold and it will kind of draw that cool air in or cool that, that coldness in but with the, uh, the airspace there that won't necessarily transfer into the interior board to make that cold as well so this is pretty nice however if you really want to make it nice throw a piece of half inch rigid foam insulation in here and that way it's insulated i think it's half inch is like one it's our value of one but it still provides that that necessary thermal break and it makes it a better uh better header now your interior walls that are non-load bearing you can just take two two by fours lay them flat on top of each other nail them down you can see what the, the profile looks like and so if it's not supporting any weight you can use an interior header like this now let's say your openings are larger, then here are some options that you could use. Um, once you get beyond 8 or 10, 12 feet in those ranges, a lot of construction workers, carpenters, contractors, they turn to the LVL, which is just like your girder. Okay? And this can, you know, the right LVL can span 18, 20 feet. So um, LVL is an excellent option. Some other engineered options are a glue lamp, which this is like stacked two by fours or two by sixes that are glued, stacked, and pressed together. So this creates an incredibly strong beam. Your LSL or paralamp, LSL stands for laminated strand lumber versus laminated veneer lumber. Laminated strand is kind of like OSB, but it's one big block. So, um, so this is, uh, um, so this, this has got, you know, these are all engineered options for those larger openings. Another one that's a little bit newer on the scene is a doubled up wooden I-beam joist. So a TGI joist, put two of them together, and then it's plenty strong for your header. But the neat thing about it now is they'll spray foam the inside of it, and that way it's insulated with uh, several inches of in insulation and it makes it really warm it's really strong now if you don't want to spend the money and spend the time on these you can have a strong header and if you're using two by six walls it's got to be a two by six okay then if it's not two by six then this is not exactly what but you can have an insulated built-up header so again here's a two by six Bottom four is kind of like these box beams. So the bottom four there, you got your two, two by tens, two by twelves. Then you have a piece of OSB here. In a space between this, you can use rigid foam insulation. And it's enough space for two inches of insulation, which makes this a well insulated header, plenty strong. And the reason for the OSB on the outside is so that you can screw your drywall to it and it'll catch drywall or whatever wall paneling whatever it is. Um, however the the uh, insulation this is, won't necessarily grab those screws really well and won't provide a secure anchor point. Um, and you just you take like three inch screws and drive them through this piece of OSB to screw the insulation and hit the head. So that's how this stays in place. All right. Let's talk more about the built-up headers. I, I mentioned this is what we're going to be doing primarily. A built-up header is made of three parts. You have two-by material, half-inch OSB or plywood, and two-by material. Now, it's, when I say two-by, that leaves the, the, the width of it open, depending on what you need. So two-by-four is six, eight, ten, twelve. Uh, two-by-fours, you do this for an interior wall. Okay, interior wall is okay. Exterior wall, two by four built up header, generally not okay. Um, that's when you go to two by sixes or above. Now, um, obviously, the longer the opening is, the bigger it needs to be, but consult your building codes and it'll tell you when you can use a two by eight versus a two by 10, or a two by 10 versus a two by 12. All right, when you put these together, you might think, oh, just stack them and nail them. But before you do that, go ahead and run some glue all the way down there between the parts. That way it gets stacked up and pressed together. All 
one at a time. Okay, there are there are three different ways to do wall framing or corner framing rather. You've got an incorrect way, you've got a traditional corner, you've got California frame. Um, this one over here is just two end studs. They get nailed together. That'll work in a shed. That would work in like a kid's playhouse, not in not an in interior frame because there is no place to support that piece of drywall that goes on over here. Here you're just fine because you can screw in this way. But there's nothing to support this wall. This is not a good option. The traditional corner, what they do is they take three studs and they pack them here in the end of wall A and the end of wall B is just like what you would normally have, just one single stud versus three studs. So all together, you have four studs, okay? But to do this, it takes more time and uses an extra stud here in the middle. So you got studs one, two, and three. Stud two is completely unnecessary, other than to just space it out so you have enough room to attach your interior drywall or whatever your wall cover. And because it's all solid, it could produce a cold spot. Now, some people, instead of the stud number two, instead of it being a full stud, they'll take 12, 16 inch pieces of blocking and put like one, two, three, just like what I showed you with the, uh, where you've got one stud, a second stud, you got a piece here, here, and here with a the wall framing, uh, with the blocking. Um, that's what that's what they'll do. It uses less material, but again, it still takes more time. Um, so this is not, people don't use this as much. Some people are stuck in ways, still use this. But the California corner, this is, this is the best option here. Number one, it takes less time. Number two, it only uses three studs instead of four. So it uses one less stud for every corner. And it does provide a place for your interior drywall or interior wall covering to connect. And you can tuck insulation behind you. So this is the best option that there is. Okay? And this is what I want you all working with. Now, when we get to wall framing, I will, or when we get to actually building the walls, I'll talk more about this. Okay, corner framing. Now, when you're working with the corner framing, um, a lot of people, they'll build their wall, like wall A here, they hook their tape on the end, measure 16 three quarters, put their X, and keep rolling like that. And that's what you do for wall A, that's totally fine. But a mistake a lot of my students make is what they do, they hook their tape on the edge of wall B and pull down here 16 and 3 quarters uh, and put their X and go from there. But what happens is once the two walls are put together, the OSB that you put on the outside of them goes up to this corner here. So all of a sudden, now all your layout studs don't like your your OSB doesn't land on a stud. It's going to be short. So here's what needs to happen. You need to remember that the measurement you provide essentially needs to be pulled from the same corner as wall A. So wall B layout measurements need to be pulled from wall A. Now, how do you do that if the walls aren't built? Glad you asked that question. The easiest way to make this possible is to hang your tape three and a half inches over the edge of your stud. So essentially, instead of hooking your tape at zero and pull it down this way, you're going to recalibrate your tape and slide it over to where three and a half inches is now the zero mark at the end of your board. Then you mark your, your standard 16 and 3 quarters, 32 and 3 quarters, 48 and 3 quarters, all the way down. But one thing you got to make sure is you have to hold the tape steady. If your tape shifts left or to the right, even a quarter of an inch, a half of an inch, it's going to throw off all your layout. So make sure that this is spot on at three and a half inches. You need to have somebody hold it there while you do all the layouts. So be it. Uh, but what this will do, this will make sure that when you put the OS, exterior OSB on, everything's going to land on the stud. Okay? 
And last thing I want to talk about is interior wall section. Now that wall assembly, the wall partition assembly that I showed you earlier was what we used to call a T-post, where you have a full stud here, full stud here, and either a full stud or blocking. And what that does, your interior partition, uh, you match that right up with the blocking or that center stud, and you have something to attach drywall here, 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 and there. Everything's good. The problem with this, it, does, it uses more materials, and it creates an insulation void. Because remember, once all the wall framing is up and the whole place is dried in, then the insulators come in and insulate it so it stays warm. But there's no, there's no way that they can get insulation inside here unless they drill holes and spray in insulation, which takes a lot of time and takes a lot of that spray foam material. Um, so there's no way to easily do this. So advanced uh, in wall intersection framing, what this does is this use your on center stud here and here of your exterior wall, and then you put a piece of blocking in between those wherever your interior partition is. So you can see here the vertical stud on center stud, vertical on center stud, piece of horizontal blocking in between, and here's where your uh, interior wall. Now, so what this will do is when you have enough of these, in an eight foot wall, you put five or six of them up so that they can be no more than 16 inches apart. And put a five or six of them up the wall and it has a place for the interior wall to attach and it has a place for the drywall to catch. And you can tuck insulation in behind the wall. So it's the best option. Um, and so again, fully insulated, it uses scrap material that you have around on hand, and, um, and it's, it's a steady, it's just a, it's a, a steady option. Okay, one last thing. When you get the walls up, you need to brace them in place. I talked about this back in the very first slide. You gotta put them temporary braces up. So in this picture here, you got a temporary brace, Temporary brace, temporary brace, and they're nailed to a stud here, here, and there. And then you take a wood cleat, which is basically a piece of scrap that's like uh, two, you know, two by four, or two by six, whatever it may be. Something about a foot long. Um, and sometimes people will use one, sometimes people will use two. And you nail that to the subfloor. And then once you put the, the level on this and get them plumbed up, you nail the top and the bottom and that holds it steady, okay? So they need the temporary bracing, and again, using the cleats and the anchors and the diagonals here, uh, keep all the walls uh, you know, plumb and square, and you're gonna brace in multiple locations. You know, one brace for the whole wall is not necessarily enough. And those braces stay up until you get the exterior sheathing on, the roof built, and the sheathing on the roof. Once that all happens, then you can pull those braces down. Then the, the home's not going to ship it. But you keep those up throughout the construction process until you get the whole house sheathed and closed down. Okay, so you got a few definitions to copy down. Take a photo of that, send that in to Canvas, and I will see you in the next video.